Good afternoon and welcome to today's Ticket to Work webinar, Ticket to Work and Mental Health. My name is Derek Shields and I am a member of the Ticket to Work Program Manager, <laughs> the moderator for this webinar. We are so pleased to have you with us today to learn about Social Security's Ticket to Work Program and how it can help you as you start or expand your path to financial independence through work. We also be covering managing stress and other mental health strategies during the job search and work. Each of us has our own journey, and we hope you will get some information today that will truly help you on your path to employment. Let's get started by reviewing some of the functions of the webinar platform so you can interact and get the most information out of today's session. First, you can manage your audio using the audio option at the top of your screen. The audio option is an icon that looks like a microphone or looks like a telephone. All attendees will be muted throughout today's webinar. Thus, when presented with options for joining the audio conference, choose listen only in the bottom right. Choosing listen only allows you to have the sound to be broadcast through your computer speakers or headphones so please make sure your speakers are turned on or your headphones are plugged in. If you do not have sound capabilities on your computer or prefer to listen by phone, please dial 1-800-832-0736 and enter access code 4189148 pound sign. Next, we'll cover some information about webinar accessibility. On the Adobe Connect platform, you will notice different boxes on your screen. These boxes are called pods. We'll have the presentation pod where the slides appear. This is the largest portion of the screen. Below that is an open space. This is for the placement of the captioning or closed captioning pod. In the top right corner is the Q&A pod. Below that is the web links pod. We'll talk a little bit more about these pods in more detail now. If you need assistance navigating Adobe Connect, an accessibility user guide complete with a list of controls is available at http colon forward slash forward slash bit.ly forward slash adobe hyphen accessibility. This link is also available in the web links pod in the bottom right of your screen. It will be entitled Adobe Accessibility User Guide. Real-time captioning, as I mentioned, is available and is displayed in the captioning pod, which is below the area below the main um, PowerPoint slides. You are able to show or hide the captioning display, and you can also choose the text size and text color combination to best meet your vision preferences. This CC or closed captioning link is available in the menu area. By selecting that, you can then choose text size and text color to best meet your requirements. The captioning link can also be accessed in the web links pod under the title web captioning. Next, if you're fluent in American Sign Language and would like support during today's webinar, please follow the link below that provides instructions on how to connect with an interpreter through the Federal Communications Commission Video Relay Service, or FCC VRS. The ASL User Guide can also be found in the web links pod under the title of ASL User Guide. Now we are here today to answer questions that you may have about the Ticket to Work program. Please send your questions to us at any time throughout the webinar by typing them in the Q&A pod. We'll then direct the questions to our speaker during the Q&A portions of our webinar. We will be addressing questions at different points during the presentation. So please send us your questions and we'll do our best to get to as many as possible today. If you are listening by phone and are not logged into the webinar, you may ask your questions by sending an email to Ticket to Work, and that email address is webinars at choosework.ssa.gov. 
www.gov. Another resource available that we think you will find very useful is the web links pod. You will find this pod in the bottom right of your screen. This pod lists all of the links to the resources covered in today's webinar. To access any of these resources, please highlight the topic you are interested in and then select the browse to button at the bottom of the pod. If you are listening by phone and are not logged in, you may email webinars at choosework Dot SSA dot gov for a list of available resources. Or you may reference your confirmation email for today's webinar to access a list of all of those available resources as well. Also, please note that Social Security cannot guarantee and is not responsible for the accessibility of external websites. Today's webinar is being recorded and a copy of it will be available within two weeks on the Choose Work website at http colon forward slash forward slash bit.ly forward slash wise underscore on demand. This link, as well as others, can be found in the web links pod in the bottom right corner of your screen. It will be titled Wise Webinar Archives. We hope that everyone has a great experience during today's webinar. However, if you experience any technical difficulties during the session, please use the Q&A pod to send a message, or you may email us at webinars at choosework.ssa.gov. As I mentioned at the start, my name is Derek Shields, and I am a member of the Ticket to Work team and will be serving as the moderator for our webinar. We are also delighted to have with us Ray Sibula. He is our presenter today. Ray received his law degree from the University of New Hampshire's Franklin Pierce School of Law. He spent 23 years providing legal services to individuals with disabilities in their interactions with Social Security. He then became part of Cornell University's Work Incentive Support Center and in 2005 joined the staff of Cornell's Yangtan Institute on Employment and Disability. He now serves as the program director of YTI Online, Cornell's Work Incentives Practitioner Credentialing Program. During today's webinar, Ray will cover Social Security's ticket program, ticket to work service providers, and importantly, managing stress during a job search and on the job. It is now my pleasure to introduce Ray for him to begin with an introduction to the Ticket to Work program. Over to you, Ray. Thank you, Derek. Can you hear me? Confirmed, yes. Go ahead, Ray. Thank you so much, Derek. I just wanted to make sure. Okay, let's move right into the Ticket to Work program. Um, the Ticket to Work, it says here, supports your journey to work, and that's exactly what it does. And we got to go through some basics um, that are going to relate to your individual situations uh, in order to get you prepared to start using that ticket or taking that journey to work. We've got two different disability programs, and they are very, very different. Uh, Social Security. The administration does administer both benefits. The first one you can see is SSDI, uh, or Social Security Disability Insurance. Um, it is exactly what it says. It's an insurance plan. Uh, in order to be insured, one needs to work, pay FICA taxes, and you're buying credits. Yeah, and those credits are going to eventually insure you. Uh, they're going to insure you for retirement. They're going to reassure you, insure you against disability if a disability prevents you from working. So these are folks who have worked and have worked enough and have paid insufficiently in order to draw back. The other program is SSI, Supplemental Security Income. Notice there's no insurance there. Um, and this is not an insurance plan. It is basically a federal welfare program that's paid to the aged, blind, and disabled. Uh, yeah, it's 
the amounts are going to be fairly similar uh, because there's a federal benefits rate. This does not require work activity at all. It doesn't require that you've paid in. So people who have, have, have worked and may have a low benefit could potentially get an SSI supplement. People who have not worked at all could get a full payment. Yeah, and sometimes people who work just don't work long enough if that disabling condition prevents that. That person might not be fully insured for SSDI, but will be eligible for SSI. Two very, very different programs. And the people who are going to be on your employment team need to know and they need to be sure which benefit you're on and how much you're receiving. And how do you find out that? You know, you'll get notices from Social Security uh, that will, you know, every year you get one that says what your benefit's going to be for the new year. That's a great thing to hang on to. But we can't wait until January because it's only June. So why not sign up for a My Social Security account? You know, they are absolutely wonderful things. You know, I had one very early on, and I use it. You know, I use it quite regularly. You can sign up at Social Security. You know, there's a web pod in your uh, box, web pod box, that will get you to that. Go on the website, socialsecurity.gov or ssa.gov. That's going to get you there. What you can find out is, what did I earn last year? What did I earn last year? You know, I will be looking in probably April when I get my notice from Social Security that says, time to check to see if your wages are okay. You know, what happens if I retire today? That website is going to tell me what I'm going to get, what my family members might get. You know, it's going to give me a lot of information, and that could be a good source of information to get what you need for your employment team. So I'm going to encourage you all, and I know some of you are here every month with us. If you haven't done it yet, do it today. So starting that journey to work, you know, it, it is a big decision. Yeah, and we are not here to make that decision for you. We are here to give you all of the information we can possibly give you to allow you to make the right choice. And only you can make this decision. You know, we don't want to tell you what kind of job you can have or how much you should be working, you know, or whether or not you should. You know, we give information. If you return to work, this is what we can see happening. You know, and better to know before you start. Talk to us. We'll help you make that decision. But again, this is up to you. So why choose work? You know, they're, not everybody's going to be able to make a living through work. But that's not the goal here. The goal is to work. You know, I think that once you make that decision and you're leaving your home or you're coming into where your computer is to work from home, you know, you're going to understand why we encourage work. You're engaged with people, even if it is through one of these machines. You know, your mind is focused on work. You know, you're not focused on what ails you. You're not focused on what's going on in the world. You're focused on work. And there is product from what you're creating. This is a good thing, and it helps people and encourages people to stay at work. I think once you understand after today what kinds of free services and supports are going to be available to you, that work is going to far outweigh the risks. You know, cash benefits in SSI are going to go down because you're working. If you work over a certain level, your SSDI benefits may go away for a while. But you're always going to have more money. Yeah, and I didn't mention healthcare because healthcare is going to last so long, you really don't need to worry about it too much. 
there's got to be a plan for you that's prepared that will let you know all of this. The ticket to work. You know, this program started in, uh, it was, uh, Bill Clinton signed it in December of 1999. It is a free and voluntary social security program. And it can provide career development and all kinds of other services to people aged, aged 18 through 64 who receive a social security disability check, either SSI or SSDI, and want to go to work. It's free and voluntary. If you want to do this after you've talked with people, that's fine. No charge. You know, no charge. I'm sure if you choose not to go to work the first time, we're going to give you lots of information and say, come on back after you think about it. So you get connected through the ticket to work with free employment services. And what can we help you do? There's a team. There are all kinds of people on this team. We'll talk about those individuals later. But how do you decide if it works right for you or not? You know, what if you don't know what your capacity to work is? You were working full-time, you became disabled, and now you're not sure if it's 10 hours a week or 20 hours a week. We can help you figure that out. How to prepare for work. You know, there are lots of us who have been sitting at home working for a long time. And if we, were to have to, if we were to go back into an office, we would need to prepare for that. You know, how are we going to get ready for that? What if you are relearning your job? You know, you're using a prosthetic device now, and I need some training so that I can, I can do the job. I just need to learn how to do it with this prosthetic. What about training? You know, I've been disabled and out of work for 10 years. I was working on computers, and I know enough about computers that they're not the same thing. I need some training to get my skills updated. Help finding a job. You know, the employment networks who are part of this team of yours tend to have local connections, and they will know who is hiring, which companies are hiring, what's the best company out there, in their opinion, you know, to work with somebody with your disability, yeah, and help you get your resume put together, yeah, help you with interview practice, yeah, and then look at that last bullet, succeed at work. Just because we found you a job doesn't mean we're going to let you go. You know, we don't want to do that. We want to make sure that for several months after you begin, we can continue to work with you and be there to support you if that's necessary. You know, getting you into a job situation and have something go wrong shouldn't mean you have to quit. We can help you work around that. So ongoing on-the-job supports if needed and just ongoing support for your efforts. You can learn more at what is Social Security's Ticket to Work in the web pod, pod box. The Ticket to Work helpline. You know, we have this great place where you can start. You know, if you're not sure who to make contact with in your community, the helpline is a good place. They'll get you in contact uh, with somebody in your local area yeah, and help you with some information to get this journey to financial independence working. Uh, and you can call that Ticket to Work helpline Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern Time. And that phone number is 1-866-968-7842. And if you use a TTY, it's 1-866-833-2988. So who are these providers? I've told you you have an employment team out there, and now we need to talk about the members of that team. You may need all of them, you may need one of them, but we're all waiting to help. Who can, achieve you, who can help you achieve your work goals? Well, look at the providers. Employment networks, 
otherwise known as ENs. Workforce ENs. You know, we're talking about the job centers, you know, the one stops, you know, uh, the, uh, and the, those people are, you know, fabulous. That's a great first stop because they're going to give you access to computers, not only to help you do that resume, but also to help you start the search. How about the VR agencies, your state VR agency? They're a big player in this. If you need some serious rehabilitation services or some serious educational training, anything like that, that's where you're likely to get those services. The WIPA programs, the Work Incentive Planning and Assistance programs, are out there to help you determine what might happen to your benefits. And they're going to look at your Social Security benefits. They're going to look at your health care. If you're receiving SNAP benefits, they're going to look at that. Maybe you're in subsidized housing. They're going to look at that. And if you return to work, what's going to happen to each of those benefits and when? And that's a great thing to know. There are not supposed to be surprises. You know, and we don't want a surprise happening, you know, particularly when you're concerned about health care and finances. The last player on your team is the PABS program, Protection and Advocacy for Beneficiaries of Social Security. This is the legal wing of things. You know, if you have a question about how do I ask this brand new employer for a reasonable accommodation. PABS can help you, you know, talk you through that. If you're really uncomfortable about it, and lots of people are, they may talk with your employer with you. you know, it, they're in every state, so they can be called upon to assist with any barriers to employment. Now let's get a little deeper into each one. That employment network, the EN, is a private or public organization that has an agreement with Social Security to provide you with free employment services, the whole gamut. You, know, you have to be eligible for that ticket, so you're aged 18 through age 64. You know, again, many state public workforce systems, the American Job Centers, our employment networks too. We just call them workforce ENs. How can an EN help you? Lots of things. I, I think this is everything everybody needs regardless of their situation to find a job. You know, the goal here is financial independence through work. We can help you identify your work goals. You know, maybe you don't want to just get a job. Maybe you want that job to turn into a career. And well, let's get a job and we'll work towards the promotions that you need so that you're on a career path. You know, what are your interests if you don't have a recent work history? Many people have interests that they're passionate about that can be turned into jobs. How about writing that resume? You know, I always tell this story to everybody. You know, I haven't written a resume in 25 years. And if I needed a resume today, I would have no clue where to start. Because they change. They don't look like they used to look. I need help. Preparing for interviews. You know, interviews are a very tense situation. They just are. You, know, you need to have answers. You, know, you need to be able to ask questions when they say, do you have questions of us? Practice and preparing those questions are really critical to your making a good show of yourself. Reasonable accommodations we talked about. You, know, you need to ask for them. You know, employers may be a little bit reticent at times because they don't quite know what you're going to ask for or how much it's going to cost. We know statistically that the average accommodation is still around $500, so it's not going to break the bank. But how do you do that? How do you do that 
without letting somebody know you're on benefits, if that's what your choice is, very hard not to divulge a disability. You have to say what's wrong and why you need the accommodation. But talk to somebody about that before you do it. And receiving benefits counselors. Lots of ENs have benefits counselors right on staff. And again, the WIPA programs are available in your area if the employment network you're working with does not have a counselor. Now on to State VR. State VR provides a lot of services to people with disabilities. Yeah, and the goal for the State VR agency is to get people back into the workforce. And that may be by entering a new line of work, you know, or the first time job. You know, you could very well be, you know, that you've not tried to work yet and you're thinking about it. That's okay. You know, let's start and get this process going. So the state VR agency can offer benefits counseling as well. You know, lots of folks, lots of state VR agencies have entire staffs who are dedicated to benefits planning. Vocational rehabilitation. You know, what do you need? You know, what do we have to do? I mentioned that prosthetic device. Do you need to be fit for one and then be trained to use it? You know, it's one thing to get a prosthetic hand. It's another thing to make it work on a typewriter. So there's training involved with that to get you back into the workforce. Training and education on anything. You know, I mentioned earlier retraining. Can you do your old job in a different way? You know, do you need that training to get your computer skills updated? You know, or are you looking for you know, a basic community college education? You want to be a teaching assistant. You need a two-year associate's degree. Community college can get that for you. VR can help you get to the community college. There's this new kid on the block uh, called Partnership Plus, which I think is great. I think it's the best thing since sliced bread. You used to have to get your ticket to either VR or an EN. Now you don't have to anymore. If you want to work with the state agency because you want to go to school for two years, you can do that. And then when you finish that goal of getting that training, a private EN can take the ticket and help you get the job, get what you need to get started. It's the best of both worlds. I mean, it really is because you get the heavy hitter state VR and the education paid for, and then the smaller player, the employment networks, you know, who are there to focus on getting you placed, supporting that transition you know, to work. It's a really, really good deal. Um, if your state doesn't have a formal partnership plus agreement, you can still work with an EN after your case closes. Partnership Plus just sort of seals the deal. Look at that Partnership Plus fact sheet in the web link pod. Um, it's really a good program. And now the WIPAs, the Work Incentive Planning and Assistance Programs. You know, they are staffed by Community Work Incentive Coordinators, uh, or CWICs, and they provide free benefits counseling have to be a Social Security Disability recipient, SSI or SSDI. And they're going to talk to you about how you're attaining a job and beginning to earn income is going to affect your SSDI and your SSI. And I'm going to tell you right now, this is why you need to know what benefit you have and how much it is. The rules are remarkably different for both programs. How about Medicare or Medicaid? Is there any risk to that at all? You know, when will that become apparent? If we just use Medicare, and I tell you seven and a half years after you use up your trial work period, that's a signal to not worry about it for the first five years. If everything is going well, we'll talk about it five years from now. Right now, focus on work, because your Medicare is fine. 
How about to help you understand the work incentives? Again, different work incentives for each program. You know, SSI has some, SSDI has some. There are lots of them. You know, there are so many of them you know, that you know, it, it's going to surprise you. And what they're used for is to deduct countable income. If you earn $1,000 a month, you know, we could use some work incentives to show that you know, Social Security is only going to worry about 500 of it. Yeah. it. These things are really, really exciting. I mean, if they weren't exciting, I wouldn't have spent <laughs> my career using them. But they're wonderful work incentives, and you've got to know that they're there to help ease this transition and make it comfortable for you to watch those benefits shrink away because there's always more. Yeah. How about explaining the potential benefits of employment and dispelling the myths about work? And there are lots of benefits to work you know, that are beyond that paycheck. Yeah, and I know that your first concern is going to be the paycheck. That's my first concern too. But you know, I have three dogs because I work. You know, I have a house because I work. I have a car because I work. And those things you can't take for granted. You know, I went to the movies for the first time since the lockdown last weekend. And it was like, I went to the movies. If I wasn't working, I couldn't do that. And so simple things that are out there. And I know it's all about the finances, but we're going to make that make sense to you so that you can just enjoy life a bit more. How about help you decide if the services and supports are right for you? Yeah. Let's go back to the ENs. You know, employment networks tend to work with a specific disability population. So if I am blind and I go to an EN who specializes in physical impairments, that doesn't sound like a good match. Yeah. And so maybe the WIPA program can refer you to a more appropriate EN. Yeah. And I, I hope you've noticed throughout all of this that there's no wrong door. Whatever door you knock on is going to be the right door. Who do WIPA projects serve? Right now they're serving people who are currently employed or self-employed or have job offers pending or are actively interviewing for jobs. That means you had an interview in the past 30 days or you have one scheduled in the next two weeks. There's a special category for transition aged youth, aged 14 to 25. Even if they're just beginning to think about the topic of work, so if you don't fall into those categories, don't be leery. There are other benefits planners out there, and most certainly your WIPA program can get you to those. Now, the last one is the protection and advocacy for beneficiaries of Social Security. Now, this agency, the Protection and Advocacy Agency in your state, usually Disability Rights California, Disability Rights Oregon, something to that effect. Um, they're going to provide you with legal support. How do I ask for a reasonable accommodation? What kind of accommodation am I entitled to? Well, that can be had by talking with the PABS program. What about advocacy? You asked for a reasonable accommodation, it was denied. And now you need to take this up one step more and you would like an advocate to work with you. How about help with resolving employment concerns with employers, Social Security, an employment network, a state VR agency, a WIPA project, or somebody else? This is kind of like a watchdog can help you navigate this entire system if it gets too confusing and things just aren't working right. You know? So remember, give them a call as well. PABS can help you navigate these organizations and services. 
yeah, so that your work effort will be supported and all of your rights will be protected. Again, requesting reasonable accommodations. That includes in college classes, in training courses, licensing programs, as well as the workplace. If I'm going to community college for that teaching assistant degree, what if I need somebody to take notes for me? That's a reasonable accommodation. You know, most community colleges are superb at that, but PABS is there if they happen to say no. And of course, addressing other disability-based legal issues that are barriers to employment. So how do you find these people? You know, there is a Find Help page. That's in your web link pod as well. And you're able to search by zip code, by the services offered. That's a great one. Is somebody not going to be able to get you a training course that you want to, but they will be doing the resumes and the placement. Disability type. That's critical. You know, I don't want... You know, I told you, if I had blindness, I don't want to be working with somebody who only deals with physical impairments. What languages are available? You know, if your first language is Spanish and you feel more confident and able to communicate in that language, you can look for an EN or a PABS program or a WIPA that can provide you services in Spanish or simply by provider type. You know, do you want to reach out to an EN just to start? Search for ENs. You know, if you don't narrow your search, of course, you're going to get, I think, too much information. But I want to talk to a benefits planner first. So click the WIPA box, and you'll get the list of WIPA programs that can help you. It's a very easy thing, and I am at the point in my life where I say, if I can do it, anybody can do it. You know, and last but not least, do not forget that Ticket to Work helpline. You know, they can get you a list of uh, service providers in your area, and all you need to do is dial 1-866-968-7842 or 1-866-833-967 for TTY users, Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern Time. All right, Derek. With the first question break. Excellent. Thank you, Ray, for covering the ticket program and all the details. You know, you, you went through a lot of great content. I wrote down one thing you said. It really resonated with me. The goal here is financial independence through work. And then you really covered all of the providers there that can help navigating that pathway. So, um, yes, we are taking a couple breaks for questions. This is the first one. Um, and as a reminder, we encourage you to submit your questions so Ray is able to answer them. And if we are not able to get to all of them, we, you know, or they're too specific in this venue, then you know, we'll navigate the ones that are appropriate here. And we're going to try to get to as many as possible. Ray, we do have some questions that have come in. So the first one you know, going back to what you said about SSDI and SSI, we had a question, can a person have both SSDI and SSI? Absolutely. Um, and I probably did not explain myself well enough. Um, you know, when you're working and paying into the system, what comes out as an SSDI benefit is based on that. Yeah, if you're making a whole lot of money, there is going to be a higher benefit. If you're making minimum wage, there's going to be a lower benefit. If that SSDI benefit is below the threshold for SSI, you could very easily receive SSI as well. Um, that doesn't prevent anything from what I said from happening. It just means that you really need to be thorough. You know, you need that My Social Security account so that you can tell whoever you're going to work with how much you get in SSDI, how much you get in SSI. Because as I said, the work incentives are all different. 
And in order to have them applied to each program separately, it, it gets a little confusing, but it's certainly doable. So yes, lots of people have both benefits. Excellent. Thanks for providing that clarity there. And of course, encouraging people to contact the service providers to help navigate each person's unique situation. Right, next question came in. How long does a VR program last? You covered working with the state VR agencies. Is there some type of time limitation for working with a VR program? Well, you know, I think a lot of them would like there to be, <laughs> but you really can't do that. You know, I, if I to be that teaching assistant, my plan's gonna last at least two years, right? Because that's how long it takes to get through school. Well, and you add a disability to that, maybe I can't take a full caseload, so we need to stretch that out a little more. So they're very individualized plans, um, you know, and they can last several years. If you need a four-year degree, and it's going to take you six years to earn that degree, we've got a long plan. You know, so it is individualized. You know, it's your plan for employment. Uh, and no one's going to say, look, if you can't get a four-year degree in four years, we're not going to help you. And the fact of the matter is that it takes at least five years for almost any student to finish a four-year degree nowadays. So this is custom work. Excellent. Thank you for, for that answer. Sticking with the VR theme here. Um, the question came in, when my case is closed with the VR, can I then assign my ticket to the employment network? You, you talked yes, a little you bit can. about, yeah. yeah, you talked a little bit about Partnership Plus, but describe that again and be clear on with or without pr Partnership Plus, how somebody does it. Okay. Yeah, um, Partnership Plus is going to be floating around there, and I said you could do the same thing without Partnership Plus in your state. So we can leave Partnership Plus as the overall umbrella. This is for you to make that decision. If you need VR, the state VR agency, to get, help get you that two-year degree, yeah, that's fine. What has to happen is the state VR agency takes your ticket and puts it in use status. That's a good thing. They are using the ticket. You're getting your protections that come with using the ticket. Then when your case is closed, you can take that ticket and assign it to an employment network. Yeah, and it's a great plan. You know, that's how Partnership Plus works. The steps, even if Partnership Plus doesn't exist in your state, are the same. So we're going to e to VR, getting our services, yeah, and we're not assigning a ticket. It's in use. At the end of the VR plan, when your case is closed, your ticket can then be assigned to an EN who might be there to help place you, or if VR has placed you in a job, would be providing on-the-job supports or supports in other ways to you. It might be necessary for you to just talk to people. You know, I need somebody there who's watching. I just need to be connected with somebody so that I can discuss what's going on. You know, how am I being treated in the workplace? Is my employer you know, you know, understanding what I need as a disabled worker? Yeah, lots of kinds of support like that. Um, and that is the best of both worlds. It does work in states without Partnership Plus the same way. So just remember, in use with state VR, assignment to the employment network. Excellent. That's really helpful. It, it allows for the question to be answered, but also really goes into the slight difference in word choice there, in use with VR, assigned to the employment network, and an individual can choose the employment network that they prefer. And you mentioned how to find that, and we'll revisit the find help tool 
the helpline too. Great, right, we have one, we have one more question, and then we'll probably transition back so we can get into your next segment. But this question came in, and it's a, it's really about age. What if a person isn't quite yet sixty five? They're not sixty five. Maybe a month before, can they still apply it to ticket to work? Can they still use their ticket? That's a really good question. You know. <laughs> And I'm not sure of the logic behind it. Um, I know that when I started working, 65 was retirement age. Uh, so people aren't expected to work. Uh, and that's not quite real now. People just continue to work. Um, but the ticket says 65. Now, you can take your ticket to State VR again. You can take your ticket to an employment network. And the question is, if the ticket terminates at age 65 and you walk in at 64 and six months, is there time for the Employment Network of State PR to use that ticket yeah. and get you anywhere? I mean, what's the possibility? You know, so 64 is calling it close. Yeah, um, I very much support an increase in that because people are working. You know, I turned 65 almost a year ago, and I'm still going at it, and I don't intend to stop anytime soon. Um, so, but I think you got to just think about what you need as somebody who's close to 65 and whether it can even be had in the time you have because right now the ticket stops at age 65. Excellent. Thanks for that, Ray. Um, we'll, we'll add one more here. Um, somebody has uh, asked, how can I find a PABS? So you mentioned the different service providers. And yeah. you, of course, covered the protection and advocacy organizations. Can you just remind us how somebody could find a PABS that would serve them? Well, you can use that help tool, um, and that's in your web link box. Uh, that's easy enough. You know, and you would put your zip code in. Click PABS so you don't get responses to anything else, um, and they would be there. You know, uh, depending on the state you're in, I said they're usually disability rights, New Mexico, disability rights, California. You could Google disability rights and the name of your state and likely find that number too. Excellent. Thanks for, for answering these questions that have been coming in, Ray. And I, I did bring up the find service provider page. So as Ray was saying that you could go to the find help page and um, bring up uh, PABS and uh, in, by your zip code, if you like. Also just wanted to revisit the importance of the Ticket to well Work helpline. Ray mentioned these before, and I'm just gonna repeat the telephone numbers there. For service providers, um, you can get a list of service providers that is really customized for you from our helpline team at 1-866-968-7842 or through TTY at 1-866-833-2967. And so with that, Ray, I'm gonna send it back to you. We appreciate your advice, but let's move forward now so you can focus in really on our theme today around mental health and managing stress during a job search and on the job. So back to you, Ray. Absolutely. Thank you, Derek. All right. So we are going to talk about managing stress. You know, um, you know a job search is going to be clearly stressful. You know, on the job can be too. I can assure you this has not been a great week for me. Uh, and we're going to figure out some tips as to how to deal with that when it happens. So what is mental health? You know, we, there's a lot of talk about mental health nowadays. You know, but mental health is much broader than everybody makes it out to be. You know, it includes your emotional status, your psychological status, and your overall social well-being. You know, it affects everything. It affects how you think. It affects how you feel. It certainly affects how you act. Yeah, and we need to understand that, that mental health encompasses everything. 
It also helps you determine how you're going to handle stress. I didn't do a good job of that yesterday. You know, how you relate to others and what choices you're making when you're stressed as opposed to when you're not. So this is an encompassing theme that let's just narrow the world down to workers that every worker is going to face. And stress is a big deal. You know, stress affects everybody. It affects everybody differently. It affects your mood. It can increase symptoms of another mental illness. Yeah, anxiety. I, you know, throw a good dash of stress on top of that anxiety. You're going to react in a situation where one and one is three because you're compounding things. Depression, the same way. Add stress on top of that. And then we have post-traumatic stress disorder. You know, that is a serious illness that affects lots of people, lots of people, based on very different circumstances. So if you notice what your own triggers are, what are your own signs of stress? Sleeplessness? Lack of focus? You know, if you see those coming on, can we then take steps to manage that stress so that the negative effects are sort of set aside or diminished a bit? You know, we, we just need to figure out what our little triggers are. We all have buttons to push and they're all different. Here comes the work is more than a job. You know, I mean, it truly is, you know, and I'm, I'm here to tell you that it helped yesterday that I had a job. Setting goals, you know, you have a sense of purpose now. You have to get up, you have to get out of bed, you have to get to work, and you have certain things to do. So what about the goals that your employer sets for you as opposed to the goals you want to set for yourself? I mentioned somebody earlier that we got them a job but they didn't want to do that job. They wanted to do a bigger job and make this a career. Well, you got to start someplace, so do the job. But set your goals. A promotion should happen within two years. You know, what new skills can I develop to help me get that promotion? Yeah, and this goal and clicking off every little step you take towards it is a great way not only to motivate yourself, but to watch your self-esteem increase. And you've got to feel good about yourself. You know, stress doesn't help that, but you've got to feel good. We all have the basic human right to feel good about ourselves and believe in ourselves. You know, working is a way of investing you, you in your future. While you're earning more income, you're gaining more independence. You have more choice. You can do things you weren't able to do before because of the lack of money. You know, so there's a lot of good things. And when I tell you, if you're suffering from lack of focus and you go to work and you have a task to do, you know how to do it. And once you get your head wrapped around that task, the stress is going to be pushed into the background for a while. That's a good thing. So we got two blogs for you, you know, to check out mental health and work, you know, job searching with a mental health condition, and how about identifying a mental health friendly employer? They're linked in the web links pod as well. So tips for managing stress. You know, I was actually glad I read these slides yesterday. If you're working or you're looking for work, try this. Make a plan. I'm a big one to write a list for the day. What do I need to do? Yeah, and checking it off as I go. And when I get overwhelmed, I look down, it's like two more to go. That's it. I can do this. Yeah, it does help you feel less overwhelmed. You're making progress and you're seeing it. Yeah. Taking care of yourself. I didn't do a good job of that last night either. I had ice cream for dinner, you know, because <laughs> I was entitled. Be mindful of your nutrition. 
make sure you're taking your medications on time, regardless of what type they are. How about sleep schedules? You know, it's a good thing to go to bed at the same time every night. I know that sounds like I'm your parent right now, but it does work. You know, and schedule things so that you know you're going to feel your best at the other end. And ask for help. There's no sin in that. We've all asked for help. We've asked for professional help. We've talked to friends. You know, I just need to talk. That's okay. Things don't always go as they're planned. But asking friends, family, or a professional for support can help you stay on track and adapt to changes. And we've been in a tough situation for the last two and a half years. You know, it was stressful for everybody. And somehow a lot of us adapted. You know, change is going to happen. And now we're trying to adapt back. You know, so it's all stressful. Just take some steps. And you probably have your own methods. You know, go into the other room and do some deep breathing. You know, that works. It takes about two minutes. You know, learn more at the blogs again. In your web links pod, Mental Health Month, Managing Stress During Job Search. Managing stress on the job, you know, you have to stay organized. You know, I think that organization is a little tool that regiments us all, puts our brain into that little mode where we're doing things, and it does help. You know, when you work, you, like I said, you don't think about what's ailing you. You're too focused on the work. Create a dedicated workspace. You know, it could be a room in your house. It could be a corner. I know lots of people who just set up corner desks in their living room because they didn't have an extra room. One of them went so far as to put a curtain rod in the ceiling so that when she was finished with work, she closed the curtain. You know, I think that's great. I happen to have a home office, and when I walk out of this office, to stop working, I turn the lights off and shut the door. You know, make sure all of your important materials are organized and they are close where you need them. The last thing you need is to be focused and focused and focused on what did I do with that paper. Identifying your career goals, that's a good focus. You know, I have been tagging clothes at Macy's for six months now. And I really want to run the men's department. You know, what do I need to do? Because I like this job in this fashion place, but I need to know how to get there. So start thinking and focusing on that. You've got to do the tagging to get there. Create a schedule? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I am one who has calendars on computers, on telephones, on paper. Yeah, and I like schedules and setting daily goals. That's your to-do list for the day at work. What do I need to do today? Yeah. Make sure it's reasonable, too. Make sure you get your lunch. Make sure you get your breaks. How about doing a little research? You know, let's find some businesses that align with what you want to do. What are your goals? You know, if you want to run the men's department at a department store, Macy's sounds like a good place. But there are others. Maybe you don't want to work at the big store in the mall. You'd rather work in a smaller one. You'd rather work with a specific type of clothing. That's fine. Just begin to do that. Staying organized is always going to help with stress on the job because you, know, you got to get things done. That's what we all do. You know, we had to get today's session done. That was a goal for today, and we're putting that goal. You know, steps staying on track. You know, make a list of contacts. You know, who do you need to contact? 
that that first half hour in your office shouldn't be work. It should be, okay, I am going to get this day organized so that I can complete the tasks that I need to do. You know, let's make some potential contacts for that new job. Who do I need to know in the men's department to get that promotion? You know, do I have to apply for that promotion? Is there a time of year they do this at Macy's? You know, or can I do it anytime once I've built up enough skills? Is there somebody in that department who works with me? Maybe a supervisor who could mentor me. You know, how do I get your job, Mr. Supervisor? You know, help me get the skills I need. You know, track the jobs you apply for. You know, if you're looking for a job, you know, I mean, today in today's world, you could probably find one in a half an hour. But in other times, it may take a couple of weeks. Track the jobs that you apply for. Make a little chart. Macy's. Did I get an interview? Yes. Have I heard back? Not yet. You know, Dillard's. Did I get an interview? No. Yeah, but you're still doing things. It's keeping you busy and you have accomplished a lot. You're still in that process. Don't ever diminish going for an interview and not getting a job offer as doing nothing to become employed. That's a step. You've accomplished something. How about weekly and monthly goals? You know, that's a big part of my job. I have weekly, monthly, and yearly goals. You know, and you're constantly on top of that. This week, what am I going to do? I know what I have to get finished. This month, it's the end of the fiscal year. I know what I need to get done. You know, and what do I need to do for the year? I know that as well. But if you take the little pieces, it all kinds of work. It all works easier. You know, take a week. You have four of those, you got the month. You know, don't start looking at what do I want two years from now. That's a little overwhelming. But you gotta think about it. How about consult with an employment network for additional support? You may have a job, and if that promotion doesn't come around, Talk to an EN. You know, use that ticket and work with somebody who knows where other businesses are who do the same type of thing and will allow you to potentially get a promotion or maybe enter that business at a higher level. You know, all things that are putting so much focus on yourself and your betterment that that stress does really take a back seat. Here's some tips at work, too. You know, can you use a white noise machine or listen to music? You know, my radio is off now. My radio is on all the time. And I don't really think I'm listening to it until it's turned off when I know it's not on. And that helps. You know, I'm probably singing along with it while I'm doing my work and have no idea. How about increased natural lighting? You know, it may be easy enough just to, you know, take some curtains off of a window in your office because you'd rather have more light. What if you don't have a good size window? Are there any kind of light? I'm trying to think of what they were. I actually had them on plate. Those seasonal affective disorder lamps, you know, um, that can mimic natural light. How about just going out for your break and going for a walk? Go get a cup of coffee. Divide large assignments and tasks into tiny ones. Now you may have this lofty goal for this month, but if you're focused on the end rather than getting to it, you're going to be more overwhelmed than if you divide that up into tiny tasks you know, let's, if it's a month goal, let's divide it into four. What do I need to get done this week to make sure I meet that goal at the end of the month? You know, 
you've got more accomplished, right? Your list is getting checked off, your to-do list. There's more being checked off. You know, so th 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 these are little tricks. You know, and I'm, I'm a trickster. I am using these little tricks. So reducing stress at work. The Job Accommodation Network, or JAN, is a really great place, good resource um, for everybody who's listening. You know, modifications sometimes are called reasonable accommodations. That's okay. That's okay. You can find more information and confidential guidance on accommodations from the Job Accommodation Network, JAN. That's also in your web links pod. Um, and don't, don't hesitate to call them. They are really, really great people and very, very helpful. You know, and, like I said, reach out, get some help. All right, the good part about these sessions is that we always have success stories. I always, I like our success stories. They're great. So our first one today is Hazel. You know, and after experiencing some mood swings and some difficulty with, you know, controlling her emotions, she was diagnosed with multiple conditions, borderline personality, depression, general anxiety, a substance abuse, and an alcohol abuse disorder. You know, she entered drug and alcohol treatment and started receiving SSDI while focusing on her health. Hazel began to volunteer, yeah, but had concerns about how her disabilities would interfere with work after her earnings put a stop to her SSDI in Medicare. All real great questions. And notice, she reached out, she got some help, she began volunteering, reached out, and somebody talked to her about this stuff. When she was ready and motivated to work again, she contacted an employment network. You know, the employment network counselor helped her understand how working would impact her benefits. Very important information. Learn about the work incentives more important information, and transition to full-time work. She transitioned to full-time work, and she looks pretty happy to me. You, know, you can find more information about Hazel in Hazel's success story in the web links pod. And Jason has a great story, too. You know, he was diagnosed with bipolar disorder as a teenager, uh, and he looked for structure, productivity, at the VR agency, where he was introduced to the Ticket to Work program. So his Ticket to Work provider helped him with career counseling, education and training, writing those resumes, practicing those interviews, and giving him job leads. And they developed an individual plan for employment. Notice it says individualized. It's all about Jason, not about us in general. Jason was offered a job at, five, at Region 5 Services, helping adults with developmental disabilities integrate into the community. Through Partnership Plus, Jason can continue accessing individualized employment services if he needs them. He finished with VR, now the ENs are waiting if he needs them. And what did he think about this? And this is a great quote. I feel like I'm paying things forward. I had a support system that helped me, and I like providing support for others. I guess you never know what your dream job is going to be until you find it, and I really, find, I really found mine. The ticket to work worked for me. And if it can work for Jason, if it can work for Hazel, it most certainly can work for you. Now we got a new slide, uh, and this is about a new program, How to Get Mental Health Help. Now, if you or somebody you know has a mental illness, there are ways to find help. Yeah, and visit Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, SAMHSA National Helpline, also in your web pod, to find resources for individuals yeah, and families facing a mental illness or a substance abuse disorder. Now that call helpline is 1-800-662-HELP. 
help or 4357 or for TTY users 1-800-487-4889 and we do have another announcement that I'm going to tell you about now and that's the new 988 number um, there has you know the federal government's established a, a suicide prevention line uh, for everybody's use and that can be reached by simply dialing 988 on your phone. Right now, the states are protecting that 988 numbers so that when this program rolls out on July 16, that number, 988, anywhere in the country will get you to a suicide prevention line. Uh, and if things get overwhelming, Please, you know, there is nothing wrong with reaching out for help. So we're hoping, we're not hoping people need that resource, but when you do, that it is there. Again, it's going to roll out on the 16th of July. And that gets us to the last questions, Derek. Excellent. Thank you, Ray. Went through a lot of great tips on managing stress during the job search and during work. And I'm sure folks found those of use. Um, we have had some other questions come in that I'm gonna ask now. And I do encourage you to keep submitting your questions. Uh, we'll ask uh, Ray a few of those and engage now and then uh, move to wrap up. So um, going back um, to some earlier themes, I have a couple follow on questions around VR again, Ray. So first one is, can I work with a VR to go to school or get professional training? Just want to comment on that one, please. Yeah, yeah. And the answer is easy. Absolutely, you can. You know, anything you want. You mentioned vocational training, which I think is very important. But let's do education first. If you want an education, yes, the VR agency can help set that up and potentially pay for it along with your books and transportation. That's pretty common. You know, um, you know, the other, the technical education um, thing I think is so underutilized now. You know, getting a degree may not be the ticket to anything, you know, um, other than the need for more education. Yeah, but what if you want to become a plumber? What if you want to become an electrician? Yeah, I've been an attorney now 40 years, 40 years, and I cringe when an electrician or a plumber walks in the house. <laughs> you know, these are good paying jobs and highly skilled professionals. You know, and if you want to do that and become a plumber, you know the drill. You have to go to school. So you're going to get that vocational training. You're going to be matched up with a plumber so that you get on the job training and you're being mentored by that plumber while you're learning how to actually plumb, you know, and then you get your own master plumbing license, at which point you can work for a big business or you can get your own truck and be Ray the plumber. You know, I don't want anybody to underestimate vocational school um, or those technical schools because you know, we need plumbers. You know, we need all of those people. And, you know, as I said, the degree may not be the right step for you. It may not be necessary. But just don't underestimate those technical schools. And yeah, you can do all of that. I'm sorry for the lecture. <laughs> well, that's great. And, you know, to some of your other tips before starting out with the goal and then the steps to achieve that goal, if it is working with VR to go to school or get that vocational training, like you said. So I just wanted to reiterate that. Make the goal, <laughs> write down your plan, and reach out to those providers that can help. So as I mentioned, right, the next, another question around VR is, can you work with more than one service provider, such as a VR and an EN at the same time to help you start either on your path to work or start working? Yeah, that's a really good question, too, and the answer to that is no. Uh, you can't work with both an EN and VR at the same time. And 
it's not anybody saying, well, no, you can't do that. It's just that I don't think you should either. You know, remember that VR agency is going to put together an individualized employment plan. The employment network is going to put together an individualized plan for employment, one or the other. Or, <laughs> you know, there are two plans. Yeah, and if you have two plans, you likely have two goals yeah, and two different ways of getting to these places. And I think when you put two plans together, it's highly likely that you will not get one of the plans completed. You know, so I, that's part of my experiential you know, comment. Um, it's just not a good deal. You know, and we have that, remember those transition age students? They have a plan too. You know, and if they're involved with three different people with three different plans, Talk about stress. You know? um, so, no, you can't do that. You know, the rules say you can't, and I'm telling you it's a bad idea. Thanks for clarifying there, Ray. What about some of the other service providers you mentioned? You mentioned benefits counselors at the, the WIPAs, protection and advocacy at the PABs and the ENs. If I'm working with an EN, can I also contact a WIPA or a PABs? Absolutely, absolutely. Remember those five players, um, you know, the ENs, the PABs, the WIPA, the State BR, and the Workforce ENs are all available to you. Yeah, and you have to build the team that you need. Yeah, if life were perfect, I would say, look, you get yourself an EN or a State BR agency and get yourself a benefits planner. Yeah. Maybe you'll never need a PABS person. That would be a good thing because you're not by facing legal barriers to work. Yeah. So they may all sit on your team at the beginning, or you might work with an EN and a WIPA to get what you need now. And if a barrier to work develops, call in the PABS. And so your team is truly your team getting the services that you need and then if there's a pothole in the road, call in another member that can provide you with something to fill in that pothole. You can customize this as much as you want. Thanks, Ray. That's really helpful. All right, here's another question. If I already have a job and want to change jobs, can the ticket program help me? Sure. You know, it, it, that, this is another thing that they can do. The question is, how can they do it? You know, if, if you're flipping burgers at McDonald's and you want to flip burgers at Wendy's, you know, maybe not. You know, if you have a job and you're looking for another job that either pays more or is a promotion that you're not getting the company you're with, we can stick on that promotion story. Yeah, that's a great thing to reach out to an employment network for. You know, because that employment network is going to get that resume once again updated. It's a different kind of interview if you're going for a promotion in-house as opposed to going for a better job in another place. You know, and, you know, you got a promotion, you're going to get a raise, more money. That whip up, you know, that benefits planner has got to come back and get everything up so you know what's going to happen to all your benefits. Yeah, so yeah, that's very that's a very possible situation. Thanks for reviewing that. That's helpful. And um, here's another one for you, Ray. Can you work with both a ticket to work service provider? I think we're talking about an employment network there, and an outside source like a temp agency to find a job. Yeah, you know, I don't think that's going to be a problem. You know, I mean, if you're looking for a temp agency to get you through this job search, yeah, I mean, I'd let everybody know what's going on, most certainly. You know, it's always best when the EN and the temp service know, you know, if you're comfortable sharing that information. Um, but most certainly, you know, if you're beginning, you, know, you just got out of state VR services, you're now engaging an employment network, 
and you know we're going through the resume we're beginning to get the interview practice going what do you need now to get ready to actually go to a work site you know do you need accommodations do you just need some new clothing something like that you know that's all infinitely doable you know um, and I've, I forgot what I was going to say. Ah. Yeah, so you could be working with the temp agency during that month, two months, maybe three months, that you're building this relationship with your EN and getting things done with that EN to get that dream job. There's nothing wrong with that at all. You know, and I think that, that's showing that you're really anxious to get out there and do stuff and start earning money, you know, and that, that's motivation as far as I can see. Excellent, Ray. Well, once again, we've gone through the content and we're, we're running out of time today. So I'd like to take this opportunity to, to thank you, Ray, for joining us and providing all the information that you've given us around the Ticket to Work program, the service providers that are available to help, and importantly, the guidance on managing stress during this process of both the job search, but also on the job has been really helpful. So thank you, Ray. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. And folks, as a final reminder, Ray mentioned the new 988 number. This 988 number that becomes available on July 16th is the same national suicide prevention lifeline that we provided earlier. That number is 1-800-662-HELP or 662-4357 or via TTY at 1-800-487-4889. It's important to know that that lifeline is available for a variety of mental health crisis support that can include thoughts of suicide, mental health, or substance use crisis or any other kind of emotional distress. That lifeline will be available starting on July 16th nationally at 988. I will now move to provide some important ways to stay connected with the ticket program and a few other closing comments. If you would like to know more about our monthly WISE webinars, we encourage you to subscribe to our email list and to receive our text messages to find out our topics each month to receive the links to register. To learn more about the ticket program, employment service providers, and other topics, please subscribe to the Choose Work blog to get our weekly updates sent directly to your email inbox. Both of these links can be found in the web links pod under WISE webinar subscription and choose work blog subscription. We have learned a lot during today's webinar. So really, how should you get started on your path or continue to expand your search? As you've learned today, the Ticket to Work program has a variety of service providers and other resources ready to help you get started. First, you can contact the Ticket to Work helpline at 1-866-968-7842 or for TTY at 1-866-833-2967. That's available Monday to Friday, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Second, you can also visit the Ticket to Work website at any time at choosework.ssa.gov. You will find more details regarding the topics as covered in today's webinar, and we'll discover the Find an EN tool that was described earlier as well. You can also find us on social media or subscribe to the blog or email updates by visiting choosework.ssa.gov forward slash contact forward slash index.html. This link will also be in your web links pod under the Ticket to Work contact information. You can choose how to connect with us. And the important part is to make that connection in one or more of the ways that have been described. Next, to get advice and encouragement and read stories about people who achieved financial independence with help from the Ticket to Work program, you can opt in to receive text messages. 
If you're interested in receiving text messages from the TICKET program, please text TICKET, T-I-C-K-E-T, -E to 474747. Standard messaging rates may apply. Again, please text TICKET to 474747. Standard messaging rates may apply. Important to note, if you need to contact Social Security's Ticket to Work program managed by the Social Security Administration's Office of Employment Support, we ask that you do so electronically instead of by postal mail. Our email address is support at choosework.ssa.gov. Please remember, do not include personally identifiable information in your email. You may also contact the Ticket to Work helpline at 1-866 or 1-866-833-2967 for TTY Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Again, if you're sending an email or electronic transmission, transmission please do not include personally identifiable information such as your social security number, date of birth, or home address. And last, please join us for our next WISE webinar, which will be held on Wednesday, July 27th, 2022, from 3 to 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time. The topic for this WISE webinar will be reasonable accommodations in the path to employment. Registration will be available soon at choosework.ssa.gov forward slash WISE, or please call 1-866-968-78 42 or for TTY 1866 833 2967 We are also pleased to share information on the Affordable Connectivity Program, an effort to help more households get access to broadband. The Affordable Connectivity Program is a Federal Communications Commission benefit program that helps ensure that households can afford the broadband they need for work, school, healthcare, and more. The program provides eligible households with a discount on broadband service and connected devices. It also provides a discount of up to $30 per month through the internet for eligible households and up to $75 per month for homes on qualifying tribal lands. To find out if you are eligible for the program and discover how to apply, please go to FCC.gov forward slash ACP. And finally, your feedback is very important to us in planning for future webinars. Please provide your feedback and tell us what you think by taking our survey. To take the survey, you can follow the link that will pop up after the webinar, or you can find the survey link in the web links pod or by visiting the website at choosework.ssa dot gov forward slash surveys forward slash wise. Thank you for attending today to learn about the Ticket to Work program and support on your journey to employment, along with tips for managing stress during the job search and work. Please know there are supports and people ready to help, and we encourage you to reach out to begin your journey. This concludes today's webinar.